The message of grace is brought to you by Christian people who believe the Bible to be the Word of God and who appreciate its power and authority. Within the pages of the Bible itself, there's a God-given design for its study. Rightly divided, the Word of Truth is the key to understanding the Bible. We're glad you've joined us for an interesting look into God's infallible book as Richard Jordan, President of Grace School of the Bible, presents another in a series of messages designed to help you understand and enjoy the Bible. Let's join him now. We're so glad you joined us today. We trust that our time together in God's Word will be a rich blessing and help to you. As we look again into the pages of the Word of God to consider today a, a continuation of a topic we began last time, but one that is extremely important. There's a great deal of confusion around the Bible topic uh, of tithing. Uh, who is supposed to tithe? Why do they tithe? And what is the 10% really all about? Well, who is supposed to tithe? In the Bible, the tithing system is given specifically to the nation Israel. Why they're supposed to tithe? It, well, it, we saw last time, there are three specific tithes in Scripture that God gives to the nation Israel. Now, it's important to understand that, and, and you know, somebody said, well, Brother Jordan, tithe was, tithing was under the law, we know that, but it was also before the law with Abraham. And that's true. Tithing is introduced in the Bible in Genesis chapter number 14. And if you look back at Genesis 14 like we did last time, you'll see a wonderful uh, context back here that is very, that is, a, it's a typical context that looks forward in, in the history of the nation Israel to the coming of her Messiah. Genesis chapter 14, uh, verse number 18 Abraham has been off. There's been this big, the first war in the Bible, Genesis 14, and Lot is taken captive by a bunch of, in this war. Abraham goes out and has a great slaughter against these Gentile kings, delivers Lot, and com coming back is met by, the, by, by Melchizedek. Uh, Genesis 14, 18, Melchizedek, king of Salem, brought forth bread and wine, and he was the priest of the Most High God. And he he blessed Abraham and said, Blessed be Abraham of the Most High God, possessor of heaven and earth, and blessed be the Most High God, which hath delivered thine enemies into thy hands. Melchizedek comes out and declares to Abraham this blessing from the Most High God. That's a title of God when he is the possessor of heaven and earth. God has a plan and a purpose for his creation. And he, he has blessed Abraham as the, the one through whom that plan and purpose is going to be accomplished. And here comes Melchizedek. Now, Melchizedek's a strange guy in the Bible. This is the only time you see him in, in the historical record. You'll find him mentioned in Psalm 110 in connection with the Messiah being a priest forever after the order of Melchizedek. You'll find him in Hebrews chapter 7 when, when the book of Hebrews refers to Melchizedek and refers to Christ, and he says that Melchizedek, he was the king of righteousness and the king of peace, and he was the priest of the Most High God. And I said to you last time, that's always God's order, first righteousness, then peace. So as the king of Salem, he first he was the, God's righteousness was the issue, and then the peace that comes from that, that's exactly who the Messiah is going to be. He's going to be Jeremiah 23, 5 and 6, he's going to be the Lord our righteousness. He's going to be the one who justifies and brings righteousness to the nation. It gives Israel the spiritual capacity to be the people that he's chosen them to be. And through them bring peace on earth and goodwill to men. So he's going to be the king, but he's also going to be the priest of the Most High God. He's the royal priest. He's the the priest sitting upon the throne, like Zechariah chapter 6, verse 12 and 13 describe the Messiah being. And that's why Israel is going to be that royal priesthood, kings and priests under our God. They're going to be the nation through whom the Messiah, pictured by Melchizedek, is going to accomplish his purposes. And it was to this king of Salem, this priest of the Most High God, this royal priest, that Abraham paid the first tithe that's paid in the Bible. 
And I say he paid it because Hebrews chapter 7 verse 9 says that Levite paid tithes in the loins of Abraham. Tithes, were not, tithes in the Bible, are not, they're not gifts. They're not just free will voluntary offerings. They are a, an obligation and they are given for specific purposes. In Genesis chapter number 17, you see that, they, that the tithing looks forward to something that's associated with the kingdom glory of the Messiah. Now, in Israel, they had a tithing system. You'll find it in Leviticus 26, Numbers 18, especially Deuteronomy 14. In Deuteronomy 14, you, you, you see the three specific tithes that God gave to the nation Israel listed here. He says in Leviticus, uh, I'm sorry, Deuteronomy 14, verse 27, And the Levite that is within thy gates, thou shalt not forsake him, for he hath no part nor inheritance in the land. The Levitical tithe, God said a tenth, one, ten, one tenth, a ten percent of the gross national product, of the gross product of every business, of every family in Israel, belongs to me. The first, tenth, the first tenth belongs to the Lord. And what they did with it is they gave it to the Levites. They gave it to the Levites to, to, to finance the functioning of the tribe of Levi. Levi the, the tribe of Levi did not have any inheritance in the land. They didn't get a, a lot or a portion in the land like all the other tribes did. Why? Because they were separated apart to be the priesthood in Israel. And as the priest, they don't have the portion of the land. So they don't have the wherewithal to gain the, the, uh, the, the, the profit of the land. And so God says each one of the tr 12 tribes will give a tenth of their bounty to the tribe of Levi, who give up their inheritance in order to function as the royal priesthood in Israel, the nation's priesthood. Now, the tribe of Levi... Israel is a, is a theocracy. God is the, the king, and he runs the government of the nation through the priest. So really what that tithe is, the Levitical tithe, was a tithe for the support. It was, a, it was an income tax designed to support the government of the nation. If you wanted to give a tithe today like that, first you'd, you'd have to give it to the Levites. Well, that takes out your preacher. He ain't a Levite. That takes out your church, you know. They're not the Levites. You'd have to give it to the government because that's what, what they were doing. Just like Abraham, who did he give it to? He gave it to the king of Jerusalem. Doesn't it fascinate you that the first time a tithe shows up in the Bible, Abraham, the first Jew, is giving it? and he's giving it to the king of Jerusalem, who is a picture of the Messiah. Now that's going to tell you something about why it's 10%. Because we got started in this study, not so much to tell you about who the Levites are and where the, where the tithing goes, is to answer the question, why did God require 10%? Why not 3%? That's a divine number. Why not 7%? That's the perfection, number perfection. Why not 12? That's the number of the nation Israel to whom he gave the tithing system. He says 10%. 10 in the Bible is the, is the number associated with the Gentiles. The 10, king, the, the ten uh, kings and the 10 toes and the 10 horns and all that kind of stuff. All those Gentile powers. Well, why would he tell Israel... To, to give a Gentile number. I mean, there's got to be some reason behind that. Well, you'll find the reason associated with the last days of Israel when the true Melchizedek shows up on the scene. We'll see that in just a minute. But understand there are three tithes in Israel. There's the Levitical tithe, 10% right off the top of the gross that goes to the support of the government. Then there's another 10%, Deuteronomy 14, verse 21, or verse 22, Thou shalt surely tithe all the increase of thy seed. Now this is a tithe off of the net. So when you hear preachers arguing about should you tithe off the gross? Yeah. Should you tithe off the net? Yeah. You should tithe off both. That's 20%. People say, whoa, wait a minute. 
See, they're both right, but the problem is in Israel, you didn't have one 10% ten, one ten tax, you had two. In fact, we're going to send them in, you got a third one. But this one is very interesting. I bet if, if we taught this one, you probably would be willing to do this stuff. Watch. Thou shalt truly tithe all the increase of thy seed, that the field may yield, bring forth year by year. And thou shalt eat before the Lord thy God in the place where he hath chosen to place his name there, the tithe of thy corn, of thy wine, of thy oil, of the firstlings of thy flock, and of thy herds, thou shalt, uh, that thou mayest lean, uh, I'm sorry, learn to fear the Lord thy God always. And if the way be too, too long... For, uh, for thee, so that thou art no, not, not able to carry it, or if the place be too far for thee, which the Lord shall, to, shall choose to set his name there, when the Lord thy God hath blessed thee, then thou shalt turn it into money, and bind up the money in thine hand, and, and, and shalt go unto the place where the Lord thy God shall cho choose, and thou shalt bestow that money for whatsoever thy soul lusteth after or oxen and sheep, or, or wine, or strong drink, or for whatsoever thy soul desireth. Woo, isn't that interesting? I mean, you can go down and have a party. Kill the fatted calf, kill the sheep, kill the oxen, get the wine and the strong drink. I mean, the two totals are going to have a problem with this one. What are they doing? They're taking God's tithe, not the one that goes to the Levites, but a second tithe off of the net income that you have, and you don't give that to the, to, the, to the Levites. You keep that for yourself. And you take it three times a year. God required every male in Israel, Deuteronomy 16, 16, to go to Jerusalem and worship. Three times every year. Passover, Pentecost, Tabernacles. And when they would go, I mean, wherever they lived in the world, that will go to Jerusalem. Now, to go there three times a year, Passover and Pentecost, only 50, 50 days apart, that is an expensive proposition. Close down your business, close down your job, go to Jerusalem, Passover for a week, and you worship. To, to finance that, he said, you take that second festival tithe, and you take that, and you take that, if you can't, you know, if it's oxen or sheep or, or corn or beets or whatever it is, or things you've got, whatever it is, if you can't truck it there, go sell it, take the money, go up. That's why when Jesus cleansed the temple, the money changers, what those dudes were doing is they, people would come for a long way, bring, take, take their money and buy the, the sacrifices and so forth. In this case, they would go there and then worship before the Lord. Proclaiming God's blessing on the nation, demonstrating how prosperous he had made them as the head of the nations and not the tail. So that second tithe was for the worship, for the festival. You got to keep that yourself. That's why I said, I bet you'd, I bet you'd probably get into the tithing mode if you know, give 10% to the church and you got to keep 10% to go on holiday. Yeah, that doesn't sound so bad, does it? Then there's a third tithe, and that's down in verse 28. The end of, the, uh, of three years... Thou shalt bring forth all the tithe of thine increase the same year, and lay it up within thy gates, and you give it to the Levite, and the stranger, and the fatherless, the widow, and so forth. That's a welfare tithe. Every third year you take a 10%, and you lay it aside, and you don't give it to the government. The government doesn't handle the welfare. But you lay it aside where you are, so that you had provisions to give to those that were in need the widows, the strangers, the Gentiles, and so forth. And that welfare tithe, now you did that every three years. So if you annualize that over a three-year period, you were giving 23 and a third percent per, annu per annum. So in Israel, the tithing system was costing them, on average, 23 and a third percent every year. Then they could give offerings, then they could give free will things above that. But the tithing system was a tax. There was the income tax for the government, there was the festival tax for the worship, and there was the welfare tax for the poor and needy. Now, those, the, that, that taxing system to run the nation, that's what tithing is in the Bible. That's why you find it in Israel's program. Now, 
It's interesting to notice, come with me to Exodus 16 in one hand and Nehemiah chapter number 1. I'm going to move on from there now. And look specifically at this issue of the 10%. Because again, the question is, why would he use a Gentile number for the percentage? Why not a divine number, 3 or 7? Why not Israel's number, 12? You know, I could, I could really scare you, say, why not a testing number like 40? Well, you say, that's too much. <laughs> well, 3 and 7 would be less and 12 would be more, but why did he settle on 10? There's a reason. Because God extends the tenth out beyond just the tithe in the Levitical system. Nehemiah chapter 1, And the rulers of the people dwelt at Jerusalem. And the rest of the people also cast lots to bring one of ten to dwell in Jerusalem, the holy city, and nine parts to dwell in other cities. I just want you to see that when they're going to reestablish Israel, there is a tithe of the people that is paid to Jerusalem. So in the tithing system, it has to do with a percentage of the people of Israel themselves, not just the produce things that they produce, but the producers being pledged to Jerusalem. Where did Abraham pay his first tithe? To the king of Jerusalem. Now go back with me to Exodus chapter number 16, because here's a real strange tithe. Exodus chapter 16, but it's going to help you understand the meaning of some of this. Exodus 16, verse number uh, 33. Exodus 16, verse 33. And Moses said unto Aaron, Take a pot and put an omer full of manna therein. Now, in Exodus 16, the manna shows up. Okay? It's fascinating. God brings Israel out of Egypt. They go across the Red Sea. They come to the Red Sea, and Israel goes, Whoa, what are you doing? Bring us out here to kill us. Here comes Pharaoh. What are we going to do? What does God do? Moses opens the Red Sea. They go across on dry land. He closes it up, destroys their enemy. Next chapter, they come to the water at Marah, and it's bitter. And they say, All right, Moses, we don't have it. We can't drink that water. They gripe and complain. What does God do? He gives them a tree that turns the water sweet and then gives them abundance of oases. Next chapter they say, All right, Moses, we're hungry. Where's where the 7 Eleven? They're not one out here? What are we going to do? You bring us out to kill us? Starve us? We can be in the back. And they start griping and complaining again. And God, what does he do? He sends manna down from heaven. You know what God's doing with Israel? He's teaching them what it means for him to be Jehovah. The name Jehovah says, I am what? Well, there's a blank. Fill it in. What do you need me to be? He's demonstrating his grace to them. And every time they murmur, from, from Egypt all the way to Mount Sinai, every time they murmur, you know what he does? He blesses them. They want water? He gives them water. They want sweet water, he gives them sweet water. They want something to eat? He gives them manna. Next chapter, they need water? He gives them water out of the rock. I mean... He just provides for them. In Exodus 19, they get all puffed up and say, boy, you know, we're, we're pretty good stuff. Anything the Lord tells us to do, we'll do. And God says, oh, boy, you want me to deal with you on the basis of what you're going to do? Performance-based acceptance law? You know what he says? He says, stand back, boys. Don't get close to the mountain. Don't get close to the mountain. Even your animals come up here, they're going to die. And from then on, when they murmured, you know what he did? He didn't bless them. He cursed them. You know why? Dealing with God on the basis of your performance is going to get you nothing but a curse. You know why? Because you really can't do what you said you're going to do. God is educating Israel in his grace. That he would be the Lord who provides for them. Just like he told Abraham in Genesis 22. Well, one of those memorials, the manna, that little thing looked like coriander seed that they, he went out every morning and got to eat. Moses tells Aaron, he says, take a pot of that manna, put it in this 
Hebrews called it a golden pot, and lay it up before the Lord to keep for your generations. Put it in the Ark of the Covenant for memorial. Now, the three things wind up in that Ark. One, the manna. First thing went in it, by the way. Then the tables with the Ten Commandments on them. And then Aaron's rod that budded. The manna goes in first. And the Lord commanded Moses, as the Lord commanded Moses, verse 34, so Aaron laid up before the, the testimony to be kept. And the children of Israel did eat manna forty years until they came into the land inhabited, and they did eat manna until they came under the border of the land of Canaan. Now an omer, remember he said put an omer full of manna in the, in the, in the pot and in, in, in the ark? An omer is a tenth part of an ephah. Now whatever an ephah is, it's like a bushel basket. An omer is one tithe, one tenth of that. Now that's going to help you understand something about why the 10%. Come with me to Psalm chapter 70, uh, 78. Psalm 78. There are a number of chapters in your Bible. Psalm 105 is one. Psalm 106 is one. Psalm 78 is one. Where the Bible will go through the whole history, or not the whole history, but a long recounting of the history of Israel. In Psalm 78, he starts in the book of Exodus and goes all the way through to 2 Samuel and recounts the history of Israel. He starts with, the, with, with Israel and Egypt, goes all the way through David. Notice how he does it, verse 1. Give ear, O my people, to my law. Incline my ears to the words of my mouth. I will open my mouth in a parable. I will utter dark sayings of old. And then he starts recounting the history of Israel. The history of Israel is like a parable. It is like something that was written down in your Bible to teach you some doctrine about what God's going to do in the future. Exodus, uh, Zechariah 14, for example, he says when the Lord comes back to fight as a man of war, as he did in the days of battle, back in Exodus and Numbers. Isaiah 28, he says, I'm going to do some things at the second advent, like he did back in the book of Joshua, and like he did back in the book of Numbers, and like he did in Second Samuel. I mean, he takes these things. This stuff is a parable. Notice what happens down in verse 24. God did rain down manna upon them to eat, and have given them a, the corn of heaven, and man did eat angels' food, and he sent them meat to the full. In Israel's history, they eat manna in the wilderness. Now if you go to Israel's future history, Revelation chapter number 12, Revelation chapter 12, you'll see the same kind of thing takes place. Revelation 12, verse 5, She, that is the woman, which is a picture of the nation Israel, brought forth a man-child, which shall rule all nations with a rod of iron, and her child was caught up unto God and to the, his throne. And the woman fled into the wilderness, where she had a place prepared of God, that, she sh that, that they should feed her for a thousand two hundred and threescore days. If you look down at verse number 14, the woman was given two wings of a great eagle that she might fly into the wilderness into her place where she's nourished for a time and times and half a time. That nourishing and feeding in the wilderness in the tribulation is going to be just like he fed them in the wilderness back here in Exodus. Micah chapter number 7. Micah 7 talks about that and actually tells Israel the specific places Micah 7, 14, Feed my people with a rod, the flock of thine inherit, thy heritage, which, the, which dwelleth solitary in the woods, in the midst of Carmel. Let them feed in Bashan and Gilead, as in the days of old. So God is going to feed Israel, the believing remnant of Israel who are escaping from the Antichrist in the tribulation. He's going to feed them with the manna. But he put a tenth of the manna back there to demonstrate that. Now come with me to Isaiah chapter 6 for the reason for the tenth. Isaiah chapter 6, 
They keep telling me the time's gone. Always goes too fast, doesn't it? Isaiah chapter 6, verse number, number 10. Well, verse 11. Then said I, Lord, how long? And he said, until the cities be wasted without habitation. How long before you deliver us? Talking about those people in the tribulation over there. The Lord hath removed men far away, and hath great for, great, uh, uh, and, there, there, and, and there be a great forsaking in the midst of the land. Yet in it, in the land, shall be a tenth, and it shall return and be eaten, the teal tree. So the holy seed shall be the substance thereof. God is going to preserve the nation Israel. He will, he'll have a tithe of his people that are brought back from among the Gentiles and the, the, the root and the fatness of the nation Israel that springs forth into the kingdom, the remnant that goes into the kingdom and brings forth the good fruit is going to be that tenth part of the nation that he rescues from among the Gentiles. The reason for the tenth, the reason for the tithe is that it is a memorial of the nation Israel, their godly seed that he's going to gather from among the Gentiles. The reason he uses a Gentile number is because that's where they're going to be rescued from. Listen, in Bible prophecy, the tenth has to do with the rescuing of the remnant of Israel from among the nations and being offered to God as the source from which the nation in the kingdom comes. That's what's associated with the glory of the Messiah at Jerusalem. In your Bible, tithing has nothing to do with Gentiles and the dispensation of grace. It has everything to do with the nation Israel and God's plan and purpose for them. Don't let somebody hoodwink you. Rightly divide God's word. Put things where they belong. And God will use that for your blessing and the good of others. Till next time, Maranatha.